Good evening and welcome. I'm so glad you're all here. This is going to be an amazing event. I'm Laura Linnenfeld. I'm Dean of the School of Communication and Journalism and Executive Director of the Allen Alda Center for Communicating Science. I'm really thrilled to welcome you here tonight. This is going to be a, an incredibly exciting, timely, and vital conversation about journalism and the 2024 presidential election. At Stony Brook, we know that communication and journalism can and must help to create a fairer, more just, more rational world. Tonight's conversation is one of the many ways we are working to do just that. An incredible panel of journalists and media professionals are here to discuss the role of journalism in communicating truth and overcoming differences. The stakes could hardly be higher. I feel like you could say that a million times. I just have to say it again. It's so important that we bring accuracy and empathy to bear on the communication we, we put out to society. We live in an age of significant myths and disinformation, deep social and political divisions, and the polarizing impact of social media. Tonight, we're gonna try to answer an increasingly difficult question, or at least weigh in on this question. We may not get everything right, but let's make some progress. How can the media ensure that public audiences have access to accurate and thoughtful, engaging information and content? Before we start the discussion, I'm really thrilled to introduce you to a friend and colleague, Judy Brown-Clark, Dr. Judy Brown-Clark, Stony Brook's Vice President for Equity and Inclusion and our Chief Diversity Officer. I think she is amazing, and if you don't know her, you should. Her office supports Stony Brook's diversity and inclusion efforts across all facets of the institution, including our healthcare and educational enterprises. She and her team have been instrumental in making this event tonight possible. Um, I'm so grateful for her involvement and support. So will you please welcome her? Well, good evening. Uh-oh. All right. I, I, I promise you the conversation will bring up your energy because this is, these are interesting times. We're, we're navigating this polarizing landscape of today in a way in which many times it's a yes and. There's no right, there's no wrong. It's a yes and. And empathetic listening is incredibly important. This particular discussion 
speaking of ripping, ripping from the headline, lands in our office every day. So I'm extremely excited that we were able to work with Laura and the, the College of Communication and Journalism to, um, to bring this to you today. But now it is my pleasure to introduce to you Dr. Musa al Gabri, who is an assistant professor in the School of Communication and Journalism. His research primarily focuses on political um, economy of knowledge production and the social life of scholarly and journalistic outputs. He examines media and news outlets critically and has published research papers about how the media covers terrorism, particularly Islamic terrorism, and how coverage changes when a partisan media outlet's preferred political party is in power. I think these things are absolutely going to make him the very best facilitator of the conversation. He is a regular guest on media and he's um, appeared on NPR while he's been on the Wall Street Journal, Voices for America, and he's a columnist for The Guardian and Al Jazeera uh, America. Here's one thing to put in the back of your mind. Please put this on your things, your list of things to buy. His book, we have never, he did not ask me to do this, but I thought I would do this for him, his infomercial here. His book, We Have Never Been Woke, Social Justice Discourse, Inequality and the Rise of a New Elite is forthcoming from Princeton University. It will be a wonderful read. And as you hear him be our moderator tonight, it'll make it even more imperative that you want to buy that. So please join me in welcoming Dr. Musa al -Gabri. Thank you for the uh, introduction there. I'll give you a cut of the royalties for the book sale. Um, so thank you all for, uh, for coming out tonight. It should be a great um, conversation. I'm gonna introduce uh, each of the panelists today. I'll go in alphabetical order. Um, so I'll start by uh, introducing, oh, let me get the clicker here. Uh, so let me start by introducing ah, uh, James Bennett. Um, so uh, James Bennett uh, began his career as an intern at the News and Observer, uh, and then the New Republic. Um, he served as an editor for the Washington Monthly for a time. In 91, um, he became the, uh, he started as a reporter at the Metro desk of the New York Times. Um, and then later at the Times, he became the White House uh, correspondent for the New York Times, and later the bureau chief uh, in the Detroit Bureau and in the Jerusalem Bureau. Um, in 2006, he left the New York Times to become the editor in chief of the Atlantic. Uh, and then from 2016 to 2020, he helped uh, lead opinion at the New York Times, um, where he helped oversee the um, production of a number of Pulitzer Prize winning uh, works. Uh, he is now a senior editor at The Economist, and he's um, also the first American to write the Lexington column at The Economist. Please join me in welcoming James Bennett to the stage. Uh, next up, we have um, Jane Kostin. Uh, so um, Jane began her journalistic career uh, writing for uh, college news outlets with a focus on kind of the culture wars. Um, since then, uh, she's gone on this like really um, fascinating political and professional journey. Uh, she did a stint for a while doing um, public relations and uh, speech writing. And then she became a reporter um, for MTV News and later uh, a senior political reporter for Vox Media. She's been a resident fellow at the University of Chicago Institute of Politics. Currently, she's an uh, opinion writer for the New York Times and an on-screen contributor for CNN. And um, she's an incoming uh, fellow at the Center for Political Life at UNC Dornstedt. Um, in addition to her uh, written work, she also has uh, overseen a number of really fantastic um, podcasts, and she writes for a number of outlets other than uh, MTV and Vox, um, just like anywhere awesome that you can imagine uh, Jane has written for them. Uh, please uh, join me in welcoming Jane Kosen to the stage. And finally, um, let me welcome uh, Matthew Iglesias. So uh, Matt, oh, so Matt was a um, pioneer 
in blogging. Um, he uh, worked for a, a long time at The Atlantic, uh, and then later the American Prospect, Think Progress, and Slate. In 2014, uh, he co-founded Vox Media, um, where he uh, produced a number of really influential and important work, and uh, including in 2015, interviewing then President um, Barack Obama. Um, in 2020, he left Vox. Uh, well, in 2020, he founded a new uh, publication on Substack called Slow Boring. Um, in a time of contracting uh, media sales and um, media revenues and uh, layoffs, Slow Boring is really thriving. Um, they have more than 120,000 subscribers, uh, um, more than $1 million in revenue for year, and a growing staff. Uh, in addition to his important media work, uh, Matt has also published a number of books. His most recent one is called uh, One Billion Americans, The Case for Thinking Bigger. Uh, please welcome to the stage Matt Iglesias. Yeah. All right, I'm gonna take my seat. We'll get the conversation going. <laughs> yeah. All right, I hope everyone can hear me. Yes, all right. Um, so let me start by um, talking a little bit about trust in the media. So uh, um, as, as, no, as no news to each of you, um, trust in the media has been on the decline for some time. Um, this is a trend that began before, you know, the, um, before Trump was elected, but, and has continued uh, after him. Um, when you look at uh, how the trust in the media varies along political lines, you can see that um, we started seeing significant polarization around the media, political polarization around the media after 9-11, kind of expanding with the rise of the Iraq war and then um, with the election of Donald Trump, the polarization has grown um, to uh, significant levels where um, Republicans and moderates tend to be um, increasingly distrustful of the media. Most of them um, do not trust the media, whereas uh, a number of Democrats, um, most Democrats do. Uh, and then when you look at the line of uh, how many Americans say they don't trust media at all um, in polling, it's record, record levels of Americans who say they have no faith in the media today. Um, I guess I, I have, this raises a number of challenges for people who want to report on something like the 2024 political election. I guess one question is, um, in your mind, what are some of the things that kind of drive this mistrust? And um, as you do your own work, how do you think about trying to reach people who might be like intensely skeptical of the work that you do? Um, yes, uh, maybe I'll start with you, Jane, because you do a lot of work that's mm -hmm. focused on kind of bridging some of these divides and helping people see and understand each other. Right, well, I think it's, it's challenging even to, to use terms like the media because the number of people who tell me that they don't trust, say, the New York Times, but then they refer to something that I know that they got from a media outlet, it's just like, you know, gateway pundit or something like conspiratorial. Um, so they trust a media outlet, they just don't trust my media outlets. So I think that the, the challenge is that with the, it's not, it's not just about polarization. It's about the diversification of media. It's about people being able to seek out media outlets that will tell them closer to what they already want to hear. Um, we're far past a time in which you have three major news networks and three major newspapers. And we're also far past a time in which local news is truly local. With a decline of local newspapers, you have the nationalization of local news and the localization of national news. I have, you know, I live in Utah. And so I care about what is happening in Salt Lake City. And then I will be in an Uber with a driver who wants to talk to me about how Portland has been taken over by Stalinists. And I think, one, seems dubious. Two, even, let's say, if Portland, Oregon had been taken over by Stalinists, what exactly does that have to do with Salt Lake City, Utah? I think that the phenomena that we're seeing and something that I really worked, uh, I really think about a lot in my work is how 
because of the decline of local media, every story, local news stories quickly become nationalized, but also national news quickly becomes local news. People are very worried about something that is taking place very far away from them in a state they may never have gone to, in a city they've never visited. And so when we're thinking about ways to, to combat polarization, we need to talk about it not just in political polarization, but cultural polarization. Um, socioeconomic polarization, what access do people have to news? What does access to news tell people about themselves? You know, I used to live in DC and there was a real sense I had in DC in which being able to talk about the news wasn't just because you cared about the news, but you wanted to look like the kind of person who cared about the news. You wanted to look like the kind of person who had a subscription to the Atlantic and told people about your subscription to the Atlantic and how, you know, I really love that recent cover story from the Atlantic and like, Say would, that like it's a bad thing. I mean, <laughs> I would never say anything about my good friends over at the Atlantic. But it, it is something about how, you know, what does news mean to people culturally? Many people, I think it's always important to remind people that mo many people don't vote. Many people don't care about politics. The people who care about politics in the type of hobbyist way that we see so often in media is a very small number of people. And so if you want to talk, you know, that's why I try to talk more about policy, not politics. Politics is the road you take to get to policy. It's not just like this fun thing because it's not fun. If you want fun, watch sports. Um, and so I, I think it's really important to think about polarization. A lot, a lot of different um, axes. It's not just about Democrats and Republicans. It's about what types of stories are getting covered. How does that work? You know, I came from, I did a lot of work in sports media. And there's a ton of concern about the fact that sports media has become a place in which if you work for ESPN, you can make money, but they'll probably lay you off eventually. There are people who have gone for multiple layoff rounds with ESPN. But, and then that's like the big place. You know, you've got some other options. But the, the story of polarization is so multifaceted that I think it can be, there's a real tendency to reduce it to just like, how can we make Republicans listen to us? when I think it's more about what are people listening to, what are people not listening to, and how are people thinking about what news means to them at all? Well, so this point about focusing on policy over politics. Uh, so Matt, you are um, famous for uh, <laughs> focusing on um, getting into the weeds uh, and That's really right. kind of sh trying to shed light instead of heat. And how do you think about some of these questions about building trust and kind of navigating a highly contentious landscape yeah i mean you know there are i think important definitional questions because i like meet people all the time who don't trust the, the media and like they listen to conservative talk radio they watch fox news or maybe they're more highbrow and you know they they subscribe to the free press or maybe i am the most left-wing person who they read right and there's like a a spectrum there and and they read you know all kinds of media right but like I think if you look at this like time series, right? Like, do you trust the mass media in 1973? Would mean roughly speaking, do you trust the three broadcast television networks? And so I, I think people mean that they have less trust in those institutions and maybe in CNN and the New York Times. And that's what the media mm -hmm. is, right? And so, you know, their perception, um, which is accurate, Right, is that if you went through the hallways at those institutions and asked the random people, like, what do you think about politics? They're, they're mostly on the left, right? And if you work in these institutions, you really see that, especially when it comes to the coverage that isn't about policy, right? Like, I remember when I worked at Slate, and then again when I worked at Vox, like, the television critics were like communists, you know, and the, <laughs> the people who do the recipes. No, you, you know, and it's it's very visible. And, and so like I always tell, try to convince conservatives is that like the people who cover politics at these mainstream news organizations tend to be the most careful about, you know, because just as a professional working relationship, you want to talk to Republican Party members of Congress to understand the story. You're talking to conservative think tankers. The people who don't cover politics can just completely indulge whatever it is that they want to do. But that does set the culture inside the institutions. One thing that I can do as a like sole practitioner is I just cover the stuff that I think is interesting. I, I got to a point though, working at larger places where I was, 
I was like constantly being annoyed by random asides that were occurring in articles that weren't really political. But I was like, don't you guys see, like it just discredits us if like our review of a Marvel movie is just like in the third paragraph and also Donald Trump is bad. Like that doesn't like do political, no, nobody reads that and they're like, oh shit, I'm voting for Hillary, right? <laughs> they read that and they're like, this is not a publication whose output I need to take seriously. But it's actually very challenging. If you, if you try to take it seriously as a management problem, like how do you get a bunch of left of center people to not let their left of centerness leak out in totally irrelevant ways that end up discrediting your institution. But I think I, I, I think it's something that like the current cohort of news managers are thinking about more, but that particularly as the internet transition was happening in the 2010 to 2020 period, like people didn't think about it hard enough. They didn't do a good job of it. And it created a lot of, uh, you know, superfluous kind of collateral damage to the credibility of news reporting. Well, so James, you were you were um, overseeing uh, the Atlantic and then the Times through a lot of these transitions, uh, and um, working as a White House correspondent before that. How did yeah? Um, so to, to Matt's point, I mean, how do you see some of these? Well, I just like to re I guess reinforce a couple of things they said. One, James' point about local journalism is just so important. I think we don't we haven't really reckoned with what the wipeout of local publications has done. And I think it's, it speaks a lot to this issue of trust because it's deprived so many Americans of a journalism that they could actually see and touch, you know, um, that they could, you know, that, would, that actually they could see whether the reporting on whether this construction project was going forward or not was accurate. And, and it also, and I felt this as an editor, it, it, and again, there were lots of problems with the old days and it's very dangerous going down this path and you start sounding like everything was great then, which it wasn't. But, but it, it deprived newsrooms of a lot of journalists who also had had the experience of covering communities up close and having to deal with their sources the next day when they were mad that they'd gotten something wrong and have, have really having you know, that, that, that rootedness in, in a in a place where the accuracy of your work and the fairness of your work was something you were really, really held accountable for. Um, and you were just, I mean, um, there was much more of an infrastructure for training and growing journalists. So I think that coincided, was obviously related to um, all the other changes that were happening in newsrooms, particularly in that 2010 to 20, 2020 period. And Matt's point about, um, uh, politics leaking into other areas of coverage, I think, is uh, that's something I really saw happening when I returned to the New York Times in 2016. And it's partly because politics has leaked into everything in our society. Sports has become about politics. Culture has become about politics. It reminds me of what you mentioned. I was based in Jerusalem for, for, for a few years. And one of the things that seem tragic about that society is that politics fused everything. The words you choose, the neighborhoods you lived in, the food you ate, everything you did indicated which side of this conflict you were on. We're now living in a version of that kind of society. And yeah, journalism has been, I think, uh, as a result, um, uh, really um, distorted by, by that by that force. Real estate stories are about politics mm -hmm. now. You know, the sports section's about politics. And those are areas, as Matt says, the editors just, there's less of a tradition of, of, the, of really struggling towards fair representation of reality in those areas. And they're not even really fighting it anymore. Yeah, I mean, this point about how everything is about politics, actually. Um, so uh, in a series of articles I did previously for the Columbia Journalism Review, I looked at mentions of Donald Trump in the New York Times, and I found that uh, um, basically uh, they, the, the coverage of Trump was more intense than any other president on record. And in fact, uh, in 2018, he was the number three most used word in the New York Times if you filter out and, the, uh, but, or, et cetera, like substantive words. <laughs> He was the number three most used word, Trump. Um, uh, and uh, I'm dying to know what and this was a corpus that included everything. I mean, it included the recipes, <laughs> the sports, the fashion <laughs> section, right? And so it seemed like Trump had become kind of a lens through which a lot of uh, journalists were kind of perceiving and describing reality. But critically, the Times wasn't unique in this. So my friend and frequent colleague, David Rosado, 
um, visualize the trends for a number of other outlets like the New York Times and the Washington Post um, and uh, the Wall Street Journal, and you see a similar pattern, like the, the, the extent to which um, the media focused on Donald Trump was unlike any other president. Um, and similarly, when you look at television news, um, so this is from the Stanford Cable TV Media Project, you can see usually what happens is when a president gets elected, there's a spike in coverage and then it goes down. But for Trump, they ran four straight years, basically, of campaign level coverage about uh, of Donald Trump. Um, and even now, uh, they're covering him more than the sitting president, Joe Biden. Now, this, this kind of focus on Trump um, and, and on politics more broadly, um, some have argued that it feeds into this perception of bias from the media, this kind of consistent focus on, on one particular candidate, uh, and especially the coverage being largely negative. Um, some have argued it kind of crowds out other stories and priorities, or that focusing on Trump and his words and actions kind of helps broadcast misinformation and disinformation, provides free advertising. But on the other hand, Trump was a genuinely extraordinary candidate <laughs> um, in a number of ways. Uh, and uh, Matt has argued before in some of his um, uh, pieces that some of this um, coverage patterns you see is also driven by audience demand, right? So media companies um, produce work for people <laughs> who read those right. things and the preferences of those people kind of shape um, what, what they focus on to an extent. So I guess um, I'll, maybe I'll start with you, Matt. How do you, how do you think for, for the level of coverage and the type of coverage that um, media outlets have uh, demonstrated in the last few years. Um, do you think it's been too focused on Trump and politics? Do you think it's unavoidable that they would kind of focus this much? Is there a different way that they can talk about? I mean, um, you know, the, those charts are kind of shocking because I, I think if you, if you look back at American history, right, I mean, I would say probably Reagan and then Obama are the most consequential of the presidents on that list. And, you know, when we step back historically in terms of like what occurred during their administrations in the shape of American history, now we may see Trump may be president again, more things like that may happen. His four years in office, they felt very eventful, you know, to those of us who lived through them, but there actually wasn't an incredible amount of enduring policy change, right? The real significance of Trump as a policymaker is that he filled Supreme Court vacancies. Those are not articles detailing the jurisprudence of <laughs> Neil Gorsuch. They, they're just not. You know what I mean? Like, which was the that's the most important thing that happened there, though. But I, I do think this was really largely demand driven. I mean, I remember I used to, you know, walking to work during the year 2016. And it's like my job was to write articles that people would read. Like, I try to write good articles, I try to be fair, I try to be accurate, but like, you know, we, we have metrics on the viral internet, it's like, you know how many people read your stories, your job is to write stories to get people read, and I just like mutter to myself, well, you know, it's like, Trump takes, Trump takes, Trump takes, <laughs> and it's like, it's, I, I write a lot, I write fast, but it's like, how many things can I say about this guy? Like, I don't think he's good, but I actually <laughs> don't have that much to say about why I don't think he's it's good on some level, like it's, it's pretty basic, but there was this, this bottomless demand. And, you know, I was watching, uh, as I guess many people have, um, old episodes of Suits on Netflix last <laughs> week. And in season two, episode two, there's just like a random joke and there's two attorneys talking to each other, 2011. It's like, you remember that Trump scandal from last year? And the guy says, no. And he says, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> and that's showing like what a good badass lawyer he is. Uh, in Gilmore Girls, Donald Trump shows up. Like Donald Trump, was a large presence in the media before he became a presidential candidate. And he, he was a, a star in a hit television show. Like, he is uh, fascinating to people in a way that I don't think is rationally justifiable, but like has completely distorted the media environment, the whole political system. I mean, he has a level of personal clout inside the Republican Party that is really unprecedented. He has a level of media attention that is really unprecedented. And it does mean though, that it's like, if you're a journalist who thinks that Trump is bad, and then you're like constantly saying that, 
well, then the people who think Trump is good are like, this guy's a psycho, right? <laughs> it, it, whereas if, it's, if you're like that low line, right, that like um, Bush, it seems like nobody cared about him when he was president. <laughs> so, so you could write a column that's like, I don't like Bush. And like, maybe people wouldn't way, even know this. Incredibly consequential here. <laughs> right, yeah. yes. Incredibly but but I, I think that's to the point, right? So yeah. it's like, you could write an article about the collapse of the Soviet Union <laughs> without the readership of that having their perception of your article be dominated by takes on Bush. When are you going to mention Bush? Yeah. Right, <laughs> right. I mean, you know, it, it, it's. I don't know. I mean, I, I wasn't I wasn't working then, but it does seem healthier if people could process news events, not so much through the lens of a singular individual, but those are the stories people want to read. Yeah. I, I also think, um, I know that, you know, something that I think about a lot, and you, you've seen this, that like v viewership and readership post-Trump has gone down, yep. which I will say that like, Part of the appeal of Joe Biden was like, he will be president and you can do other things. Like there was something about the Trump presidency. I mean, the comedian John Mulaney used that example of a horse in a hospital. Like, what is the horse doing? Why is the horse there? What is the horse going to do next? No one knows. And that led to a lot of news coverage. I mean, I'm sure people remember in like 2017, it felt like every day at 5 p.m. something insane happened. And every day you'd be like, oh, what was it today? But I think that something that's interesting to me right now is that you're also seeing a collapse in right-wing news. Um, those numbers have dropped precipitously for basically everybody except Newsmax. And because Newsmax's numbers were never that high to begin with, they can sure. say like, oh, we've increased our viewership with 370%. And it's like when the Libertarian Party is like 50% more people voted for us. And you're like, <laughs> so five more. Okay. <laughs> um, and so I think, though, it, it's really important to think about like, what people want from news and what people don't want from news is such a driver of what news they get. And I am not attempting to say that it's all your fault, but it's like slightly your fault. And, and I hear all the time about how, and there are lots of people on Twitter who will make this argument that like, if the New York Times reported more critically on Donald Trump, then he would have no chance in 2024, <laughs> which I think... <laughs> overestimates, one, how much influence the New York Times actually has over what people actually do. And two, I think that at a certain point, if you were reporting on the things that Donald Trump does, and many people would say those things are bad, but then some people will say that thing is good, even if you just say, like, Donald Trump did X thing. I think that what people interpret based on that news, that is something that cannot be controlled by a media outlet. And I think it's, it's very challenging because I think that there are people who really, they so believe on the power of media that they oversubscribe to their belief in the power of media. They firmly believe in, you know, I think you may have talked about this online, this idea of like the media wants Trump to be president again because it'll make all of our numbers go up and we'll all be happier. I will personally not be happier if that were to happen. I will just say that right now. But I also think like, there is a sense that th the media is not as deterministic of events as I think people want it to be or believe it to be. Um, and if I can just make a quick aside, something that I think is interesting here with regard to the increased presence of the president, I think that also has to say something for the political scientists out here about yeah. the, the massive expanse of powers of the executive branch. The fact that Donald Trump could promise things that are insane or and unlikely. And then a lot of people would backfill saying like, here's how he could possibly do it without Congress. Here's how he could possibly do this thing that actually is a violation of federalism. Here's how he could do these things. I think that what we, how we view presidents and what we view presidents being able to do has changed since the 1980s. You know, what Ronald Reagan was able to actually do, actually promise, and actually deliver upon is very different from what Donald Trump could was able to actually do or even actually promise. And I think that we've seen with the expansion of the powers of the presidency, we've seen an expansion of the idea of the presidency. And you, you see this sometimes when I talk to people who are Trump supporters, who are very online Trump supporters, there is an idea that he will be God emperor. Even though he wasn't God emperor, somehow this time around, he'll do more God emperor -y things. But I think that that really speaks to, we have given so much power to the presidency and now we are reaping what we have sown. 
I would I, I agree with that. I, I, it's whether we've given more power to him. I'm, I'm less certain of, we've given him more power over our consciousness. We've given him more share of mind. Mm. And I think Donald Trump, who understands the media certainly a lot better than I do, gets this really, really clearly. And he and look, this it, a lot of it has to do with our understanding of what news actually is. I, this is a little theoretical, but you guys are all. <laughs> super educated people so i can try this i, I think theory <laughs> out there was once upon a time there was no internet right it wasn't all that long ago actually and a lot of our definition it was news, pretty wild it was, it a, was while a while ago. ago it was a while ago but it was in george hw bush's time. <laughs> that was a topic a so. lot of the definition of news was stuff that was happening in the real world like events mm -hmm. and and there were presidential statements that would be made and the president would come out in cameras in front of cameras and you would see him do it internet comes along and all of a sudden there's this huge infinite virtual world um that first of all destroys the economics of the business so there's left money to be spent on reporting in the real world but also creates this ability to supply stuff all the time and then what's happening in that virtual space becomes news mm -hmm. it's easy to cover really easy to cover you can do it you know on your computer within the virtual space and write about it you can't argue that it doesn't matter it certainly does matter and that changed our 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 our, our journalism it, it fundamentally changed our politics and donald trump understands that he can just say something outrageous on the internet and we'll all cover it and it'll drive the news cycle for the next 15 minutes until he says the next outrageous thing so yeah he'll make these statements he'll take these policy positions he's going to put 60 percent tariffs on china whether he's ever going to do that or not it's not going to matter i mean it would matter if he actually does <laughs> do it, but, but it, we're, we're going to have forgotten about it 15 minutes later and that's why the only members of congress we can name are the ones who are good at this game mm -hmm. you yep. know and this is the game they play we play along with it as news people. We don't really have any other choice because it does matter. Um, but that's very, very, very different than what the news ecology or our politics used to be like. In 1948, the Washington Post editorialized against Harry Truman complaining that he was making remarks off the cuff. A president should only give prepared remarks because whatever he says mattered so much. And our expectations have just changed radically, I think, sometimes without our really noticing it or reckoning with the, with the consequences. Well, so as we move into this cycle, I mean, like, so for instance, one of the things you see in a lot of the data is that even with Joe Biden, even when Joe Biden was the president for the first two years that Joe Biden is in office, they still covered Trump more than Biden and most of them, except for the Wall Street Journal did on them. Um, but uh, so as, as you think about sort of going into this election cycle, um, knowing that Trump is going to try to kind of generate these cycles of attention and all of this, how do you think about, how do you cover the candidates fairly, like both on the one hand and making sure that the other candidate actually gets like oxygen um, mm -hmm. in the cycle and then uh, making sure that the candidate, that, that even when, that, when, when reporters talk about Trump, that they're talking about him in a way that seems, uh, that at least reads especially to, to audiences who might be less sort of um, sympathetic towards journalists, um, that reads as at least fair or trying to be fair or balanced or something like that. I think that, um, some, I, I mentioned earlier about focusing on policy and not politics, because I think that too often, um, Journalists don't watch enough sports. Um, I firmly believe that every journalist should have to cover like high school football for a while. One, people will never be more mad at you. There are people <laughs> who to this day are furious at me because of how I reported on a St. Louis County football game. But that's another story. Um, but I think that it's so, you know, if you report a game story, you do not report your interpretation of what the score was. You do not report like, some say that this game was really boring. Oh, but like that's not that's not how you do this. You say like, you know, the Bengals beat the Steelers 16-14, there was a safety. Like you report like what happened. You do a game, it's literally called a gamer. It's you know, 400 words. You cover the basics, like here's how the scoring worked out, here's how the quarterbacks did. If there was like a crazy defensive play, you mentioned that too. That is, I think, what I would want to see people talking about Trump's actual policies. The biggest mistake people made in 2015 and 2016, and there were many mistakes, is treating 
Donald Trump as he wanted to be treated, as a tabula rasa for the hopes and fears of every American, upon which could be projected onto him as if he were a blank slate. So he could be Donald the Dove, he could want to bomb the shit out of everyone, he could be the best friend for the LGBTs, a, th a sentence he actually said. Um, he could be the best friend of evangelicals, another thing he actually said. And you're thinking about this and you're like, wow, that's a lot of things that he's just saying. So what does he say he wants to do? And what are the things that he was like, I will do these things. And then, you know, he becomes actual president and he is an actual person who'd had actual policies and some of them became actual laws, um, you know, a big tax cut and he got some Supreme Court justices. And beyond that, there was a lot of stuff that obviously never actually happened. Um, I, I, if you recall that there, he would always say, you know, we're looking at that very strongly, which is a great delay tactic, it doesn't actually mean anything. And so, and I can see again how people are reporting on him as if he is not a person who actually exists, as if we were reporting on the idea of Donald Trump. So for instance, Donald Trump announced, I think last week that he would support, you know, a 16 week national ban on abortion, which one, uh, I believe that there was a lot of talk about sending this issue back to the states, so it's kind of ridiculous anyway. But also, people are interpreting that. People are doing the interpretation game of, well, this must mean that he's trying to be moderate. He's, you know, he's going to be a moderating influence on the GOP. He's, this is going to be so helpful for Republicans, and you know, in 2024, because abortion has been this giant issue for them. And I'm like, I want less interpretation and just give me the gamer. Give me the, here's what he says, but here's what he actually did. Here's the Supreme Court justices. Here's where they stand. Who are the people who are big supporters of Donald Trump who actually want a 16-week ban? There aren't that many of them. Like, what does this actually mean? And so I think that it's so important to treat him like a real person, a person who has been actually president. Treat Joe Biden like a real person not a person who you just interpret through these like various lenses as like, he's too old, he's too sad. What will this sad old man do? Like, I think treating these people like actual people, like is he actually, you know, if this were sports, you would not treat like the, inter you know, is this quarterback sad or, you know, did he throw three picks? Treat them like people who did things. Well, yeah, so Matt has written a little bit, especially about uh, people who do things. So Matt has written a little <laughs> bit about um, how a lot of the, uh, legislative um, policy achievements, or et cetera, of the Biden administration seem to have a hard time, one, getting like the right kind of, getting like oxygen or a significant, um, you know, anyway, how, how do you think yeah, about this? Yeah, well, I mean, I think, you know, in terms of fairness, well, okay. So I think, you know, most people <laughs> working in journalism, like, I, have a set of values, right? I mean, all people have <laughs> values, um, but it's it, it, it clusters in a, in a certain quadrant, right? Where most of them like they don't like Donald Trump. Um, but I think that a lot of people working in the industry, and a lot of people, um, not necessarily readers, but like the kind of obsessive readers who tweet at you, hmm. um, misunderstand what aspect of journalism influences political outcomes. Like there's a lot of people who seem to believe that whether or not a journalist appends to the end of the sentence and that's bad, <laughs> right? Like is what drives it. So that if we're like, Trump wants to round up immigrants and put them in detention camps, comma, and that's bad, <laughs> then everyone will be like, well, they said right there in the article, it's bad, <laughs> right? But the actual power that you have in the media is that like you decide which topics to cover. You decide what I'm gonna spend my day on, right? Like in the old magazine times, right? Like we were at the Atlantic, like we would sit around a table and he would tell us which story was going to be the cover story. And like, that was a really big deal, right? It was like th that selection, not just like, what does it say, but what's there, what's on the cover. Um, public opinion about issues is not that plastic. People have left-wing views about healthcare and right-wing views about immigration. If you make the news about immigration all the time, right-wing political parties win elections. If you make the news about healthcare stories all the time, left-wing parties tend to win elections. Um, that's not to say, you know, you should make your coverage decisions just to produce partisan <laughs> outcomes, but to the extent that you are thinking about partisan outcomes, like that's what you want to be thinking about. 
right? Whereas a lot of people, and I, I saw this in, in my newsrooms, came out of this like, I don't know how they do things at Stony Brook, but like on a lot of college campuses, if somebody says something and you can convince the RA that the thing they said is racist, then the RA will make them stop. But if you're just like, objectively, the opinion that you offered is against the interests of uh, sick people. Well, it's like, well, that's fine. That's just a policy <laughs> disagreement, right? So there was this idea that like, well, if we could get the press to like say that Trump is racist, that would like make him go away. Right. But it's just like most people are white. Right. If your charge against Trump is like he really likes white people, he really wants to help white people. Like that's most people. Right. Like that's just a winning platform. And that's why traditionally, I mean, if you read William Julius Wilson, if you read um, uh, Bayard Rustin, right, if you read like the classic thinkers of the civil rights movement, like they did not want to make every debate in American politics about who's the racist and who isn't, because they would lose that debate. They wanted to try to build a solidaristic politics, et cetera, et cetera. And you know, people have come into a very distorted view of like how the world works and what's going on. The internal dynamics, a lot of publications have got, got really weird at certain times. And so I think like you should try to be fairer and calmer in your coverage because fairness is good, because it's good for people to learn things. But you also shouldn't think that you're actually like giving away some kind of political power by doing that. Um, like it, it's just like the people who voted for Trump were not unaware that liberal intellectuals think he's racist <laughs> or that liberal intellectuals think you should be nice to immigrants and that Donald Trump isn't nice to immigrants. Like that's actually what his campaign is. Is like he's saying I'm going to be mean to immigrants, and maybe going, but that's mean. But he's like, yes, right? Like that—that's literally the point. Um, and so you maybe could bring something new to the table that people don't know about. But that takes, as James was saying, like like work. You like report a new story, like find something out instead of just repeating the same shit. How do you think about this agenda? Set? So, I mean, a lot of the publications that you helped uh, lead, like the New York Times, for instance, plays a key role in setting the agenda for the entire media ecosystem, right? A lot of other outlets kind of decide what they report almost based on like what the Times is focusing on. Um, how do you think about these questions of like what stories to focus on or not? I, I, it's a... How do you, where to begin with the answer to that? <laughs> I, I, no, no, I'm, 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 not, I'm not being glib. I just think, A, I think, I think we overrate the media's ability to, um, we overrate, it's, as Matt was saying, the media's ability to kind of direct the nation's politics. And I think one of the bad and, and distorting strains in journalism now, we, we talk about, you know, lack of trust in media. I think there's a problem with the lack of trust in the reader also that's part of that problem. As the, as the media has become more partisan and more polarized, there's an idea we don't, there's certain ideas we can't share with the public. There's certain, or as Matt's saying, we need to tell them every single time. You know, there, there were fights at the New York Times about whether you should say Trump is a liar, use the word lie, as though that was going to, you know, that would decide the outcome of, of the election. And people aren't that stupid. You know, and and um, in my experience, people generally their polit they make pretty good decisions based on their own self interest about their politics. And your job is to supply information. I do think you can make. Look, I was a White House correspondent. Um, it's a really stupid job. For the most <laughs> part. Like that's really that that is a glib thing to say. I, I take that back a little bit. But you're basically a theater critic, and and I used to think, I'd sit there in the White House briefing room and I would think, like, they've taken these people who are all supposed to be really good reporters and my, and my competition was really, really good, some of the best in the business. They found a way to stick them in this room and spend all their time waiting for a spokesman to come out to talk or the president to appear to say something or tw back then, no Twitter, but w whatever. And meanwhile, this vast bureaucracy is happening around them that's having this huge impact on people's lives, incredibly undercovered, right? When Matt started Vox, one of the brilliant things they did was they managed to make policy coverage sexy, you know, and interesting. <laughs> you really did. I give you guys huge credit for that. And 
And that was really the focus. And I worry that those few um, national media organizations that are still standing, whose economics are becoming better than, other, than ever, are not making good choices about prioritizing coverage in those areas. And they're, they're chasing the bright, shiny object of Donald Trump. And, and whether it influences our politics or not in the end, I don't know. I do think it's that kind of accountability journalism is really important. I think it's important for building a historical record and the truth about our times. That's what I would like. So, so th th those are the kinds of decisions I would like to see um, editors um, uh, making, I guess, prioritizing some of those, those areas and not spending all their time, you know, um, getting so wound up about the latest um, eruption on the internet. Yeah. Uh, one thing that I wanted, uh, I'm curious about uh, to pick your brains on um, is that this is like a, a really weird race. So, I mean, there's kind of best practices for covering um, politics in general. But this is kind of a really unusual race. It's not just that Joe Biden, uh, I mean, it's not just that Donald Trump is an unusual candidate, although he is in a number of ways, not the least because he's a twice impeached um, former president who's currently facing criminal investigations and like some criminal investigations that might have significant developments over the course of the electoral campaign that journalists will have to kind of report on without appearing to be partisan. Um, it's also the first race since 1912, more than 100 years, where we've had two candidates who are going to be former presidents, um, who are either sitting presidents or former president. The last time that happened was when Teddy Roosevelt ran against Taft and Wilson um, with, with Roosevelt and the Bull Moose Party. Um, and, uh, you know, both candidates are, you know, um, historically like un unprecedentedly aged. <laughs> and there are significant um, concerns from voters of, for both about both Trump and Biden about their kind of capabilities in office and whether or not they'll be serving out their full terms. Um, and uh, both of them are historically unpopular. So you can see both of them are currently underwater in their favorability with voters. Um, Joe Biden uh, is right now uh, ranking, when you compare Joe Biden to previous presidents, he's kind of, uh, has the lowest net favorability rating of almost any president in uh, modern history since they began polling. He's even trending a little bit behind Trump uh, did at a similar point in his administration. Um, so in these respects and so many more, it's just a really, really unusual race. So it's not just like covering, or is it? I guess this is the question. Is it just like covering any other election year? Um, and if it's not, if like, how do, how do you think about how to like, navigate some of these really extraordinary kind of weird <laughs> dimensions of this race? Um, well, I think I am, I don't like election coverage. I don't like it. Um, I think that it tends to, there are people who like it. And again, they should watch sports. Sports <laughs> are like fun and everybody's like, well, great. You know, we played this game and now it's over. Um, when I was, uh, I would be seven years old. Um, so I was seven years old in 1994 and um, I took dance classes and there was a little girl in my dance class who now has become, she's like a makeup artist in Los Angeles. Um, but her parents were like very conservative and my parents were absolutely not. And she told me that when Pat Buchanan became president, she was gonna make sure that she told Pat Buchanan to put my family in prison. Um, and I, you know, that sounds insane and stupid but I was terrified. I remember I came home and I was crying and I didn't know who Pat Buchanan was and I didn't know why <laughs> we were gonna go to jail. And I wasn't sure if I could go to jail with my parents because I hope that you know there's family jail where you all go <laughs> together. And ever since then, I have found it extremely unnerving when people tell me that they really enjoy covering presidential elections. Because I think that there are people for whom presidential elections are not like, not do or die. People, you know, they, they're like, oh, you know, what will really change? But I think that over the last, I'd say, couple of presidential cycles, we have been given the message, either implicitly or explicitly, that if one person wins, you'll be fine. And if another person wins, they are going to kill you and throw you in prison and uh, deport you from the country. 
And so I think that we should have been taking presidential races more seriously. We should be taking more elections more seriously in general. I think uh, our former colleague Ezra Klein has this theory that like the 2014 midterm cycle is like the most important election that's ever happened. Um, but I think that for me covering this, like I'm not excited about it. I don't enjoy this. I would rather be doing something else. But I think it's really important to stay focused on the actual issues at hand. What are people actually saying they will actually do if they actually win the actual presidency? Not the like thing people will say because it will trigger the libs or the cons, but the things that they are actually putting together the infrastructure to actually do. And I think that that's something that really, that matters to me. It doesn't matter to me um, if Trump goes to sneaker con. It doesn't matter to me if Biden's dog is ill-behaved, though, like, Commander needs to get some help. You know, it's time for that dog to talk to somebody. Those shoes but, are doing well. Okay. <laughs> Again. <laughs> but I do think that there's something we, you know, I hate horse race coverage because, again, if you want to cover a horse race, go to, like, Kentucky. They've got them. You can cover an actual horse race. And I like horses. I think it's really important to take these, take it seriously, take the implication seriously. If someone who says that they are, are going to be in the actual administration says something that they actually want to do that would actually put large communities of people at giant risk, or they have a policy that would utterly change how you approach a major part of your life, take that seriously. And I, I want more reporters to do that and not just do the thing of like, like it's been funny, I'm not sure if anybody else feels this way, but I, have, I was speaking to someone who's a journalist. Um, they write at New York Magazine. And she was like, yeah, you know, in 2025, we might, like, look to do this or do this. And I'm thinking personally that, like, well, a lot really depends on what happens in this election as to where I will be doing anything in 2025. So I think, you know, even if you don't need to, even if you're a journalist, even if you know in your marrow that, like, whoever wins, you'll probably be okay. Remember that, for a lot of people, like a lot is riding on how this looks. A lot is riding on not just the presidential elections, but gubernatorial races, state house races, state issues, thinking about abortion regulations, thinking about you know what just happened in Alabama with regard to IVF. Like a lot is riding for people's lives, actual lives, actual policy is at play. And so I think that yes, this would be a very strange election. They're very old and they have a lot of things that they've done and they're not very popular and yet somehow they are going to be the two. I think that we've seen a lot of people, you know, the polling showing that a lot of people are still not convinced it'll be them, but it will be. This is it. This is what we're getting. So I, I think taking that seriously and taking them seriously as candidates, not as, you know, things to project your cultural views upon. Well, you know, I mean, I do think it's it's interesting, right, that there there's something like a structural decline in the popularity of presidents, right? I mean, it's 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 fuzzy, but something about the media landscape is more competitive, it's more fragmented. I think there's evidence that negativity, um, you know, overperforms, that, you know, Biden is hurt not only by critics to his right, but by critics to his left, right? So, you know, he has been, I would say, more progressive than the Obama administration on almost every issue, but not on Israel. And that has been in the news a lot. And progressive media outlets have come to focus very heavily on that topic, because I think being critical, like, does more juice than trying to tell people like, hey, look at these tax credits for electric vehicle charging, right? Like that's boring, even if you, even if you like it. And I think a lot of the outlets that right now are very focused on Gaza, if Trump becomes president, are gonna start writing lots more articles about climate change, because it'll be critical, you know, not because it's insincere, but because like finding the, the critiques is the way to go. It's gonna be, I think what's gonna be hard to cover about this season is that there is, you know, James is talking about the like, uh, replacement of news, of like events in the world as news by like controversies emerging from the internet ether. Mm. And we have, uh, presidential campaigns have always been full of these kind of like pseudo news. Um, but when you have two guys who have been very much in the public eye, there's like not that much to say. Like you can't, <laughs> you can't profile Donald Trump's childhood. You can't be like, what, 
can we tell from this governor of Arkansas's tenure about his time in Washington, right? Like the, the standard conventions of like, we got to hit these beats. All we really have is the Trump VP rollout as like, a, like that's a legitimate news story, right? Like it matters who he picks. There will be speculation, there will be reporting, that person's background will want to talk about. Uh, but like most of it, like, is there going to be like a Trump policy rollout? Like, probably not. That's not, that's not what he does. And so it's like, what, what will we do? There's clearly demand for coverage, but so we're getting, you know, more coverage of polls. Um, we have never, it has never been a better time to have somebody break down like polling cross tabs and, <laughs> you know, Nate Cohn's explanations of sampling error are fascinating, but like, that's actually not news in a traditional sense and I but like I struggle to come up with like what are actual news occurrences that are like worth reporting energy like nothing's happening we know these guys they're the the level of polarization is big enough that it's like people are making up their minds I guess but they're not exactly like judiciously weighing <laughs> two closely balanced options so it's like what what are we even doing and and then then the question of like well maybe there's an interesting story at the transportation department right like they do continue to do things in the government right like it it matters and uh, but it's a this is like a vain pious hope that we can like <laughs> cover more real things and less of the campaign vain pious hope is kind of <laughs> I mean, maybe <laughs> click on those DOT stories, guys. Like, yeah. share them. Tell well, your friends. Click, click, click. <laughs> Matt, this is this is one thing that has changed, and, and there's an opportunity there because because um, you, you know the economics of the business are less driven by clicks now than that they were, true. and in a subscriber environment like the one that you were yeah, succeeding we, so mightily in. Actually, what they appreciate about, about what you do is that you're writing about the Department of Transportation. We hope to find a niche. Uh, <laughs> yeah, but that's that's now. How do we take that? To, you know, to, <laughs> right. Yeah, that, that's and, the problem. And, and how do places, but places like the New York Times, the Wall Street Journal, that you, as you were saying, Musa, that do set the agenda for the other, have more ability, um, maybe, to do that. Um, I, I, you know, I stipulate to all of. I, I, I do think. Um, uh, you know, with, with my with my 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 like I'm freaked out about this election too. I do think, as we're all saying, the stakes are really high. All of that I, I feel I do feel too, and I don't I don't minimize that. What's weird about journalists and journalism is that there's a fundamental perversity to the trade. You know, a bomb goes off, and the journalist is running towards it when everybody else is running away, and in the same way. This is an incredible time to be a journalist. We're incredibly <laughs> lucky sure. to have the opportunity to cover this insane race and to deal with questions like, how is it that we nominate, we're on a path anyway to nom nominating historically unpopular candidates who have all the liabilities, Musa, that you describe having? Like, how, how have we reached this point? And I do think there's been a lot of reporting on these questions, Matt. I don't mean to. Yeah. suggest there hasn't but i do think there's opportunity to bang away at some of these issues <laughs> that is worth that's worth doing and i know i'm not gonna i'm not gonna feel sorry for myself that i have the opportunity <laughs> to cover this campaign like I, I it matters because it matters and 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 um and as a result i think we should feel that and i i and you know, to, yeah, well, anyway, I, I, I do think like, you know, you, you asked earlier about the 2016 election. I, I think part of part of being fair. Well, I, I, I think we, we you know, the, the I think the media is 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 it, it can't worry too much today about what the outcome is going to be. And by being very tough on Joe Biden, if anything, they're going to help him win. You know, and it, 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 right now, I think, and and one of the failures in the 2016 campaign was I don't think the press was hard enough on Hillary Clinton's campaign. They were actually pretty hard on Donald Trump in 2016, but maybe she would have campaigned in Wisconsin. Maybe she would have campaigned in Michigan if the press had been a little more aggressive earlier on about about some of the weaknesses of that campaign. So, I, I just think all we can do is 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 cover this you know as 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 vigorously and rigorously as we can 
and let the chips fall where they may. Well, so one thing that's really extraordinary about both of these candidates too is they both have in their own ways like highly unusual relationships with the media, to put it mildly. So in the case of Donald Trump, for instance, he's repeatedly described uh, the media as um, dishonest, described outputs as fake news, talked about trying to revoke the licenses of different outlets, um, and, uh, and things like this, um, generally kind of stirring up antipathy towards the media in many cases. Um, and so this raises, I, I, well, I guess, so one question that I have is to what extent do you think Donald Trump's posture towards the media, the kind of, the way he describes journalists and our outputs um, feeds into a perception that um, perhaps journalists should be part of the, you know, should resist Trump and his administration in some significant way? Or do you think that journalists feel that way at all? That they, um, that they should be part of the, the resistance. Um, and then the second question I have about Trump that's kind of related um, is like, so if Trump says something extraordinary, like I would like to be a dictator for one day if reelected in 2024, um, as a journalist, how do you talk about something that's uh, highly unusual, right? How do you talk about that kind of a claim in a way that underlines the, um, the, the kind of the stakes of it um, and the potential, uh, uh, um, yeah, but without seeming like you're kind of engaging in hyperbole or, 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 or partisan kind of conversation. Um, I think that one of the challenges, um, and I think others have brought this up, but one of the challenges of Trump is that his saying things that are objectively insane is now weirdly baked in. Um, there is, he has set a bar of lunacy that is very high and so when he says something that sounds insane, I think that there is really a tendency in some ways to undercover it. Um, like if Joe Biden were to say um, that he would like to be a dictator for one day if he was elected or um, that uh, they and others of the lamestream media will be thoroughly scrutinized for their note yet, like all of that. Like if Joe Biden said that, that would be, well, that'd be really weird. And people would cover it in a very different way. And I think that that's one of the very, it's kind of reminds me of, um, if you've ever seen, there's like that old onion piece that's like Marilyn Manson goes door to door to shock people. I think about that where it's just as like, you once you set the bar of being shocking or triggering or something like that, like it's just kind of baked in. And so I think that that's one of the challenges of Trump is to back up and say like, no, this is weird. This is very strange to say. Um, it is not good, and it is a thing that is unlikely to be done, especially because Trump is notably very dependent on media, and he absolutely loves the media. He has like a weird symbiotic relationship with media that he he will you know he wants to be reported on. He wants to meet with journalists. People wind up having you know Oval Office interviews with him for largely no reason whatsoever, and yet he will continue to say this kind of thing. So it's really important to treat what he says as a real thing that he actually said, that you don't need to do the seriously, but not literally, or literally, not, but not seriously kind of thing, but do treat it as like, this is the thing that a person who was running for president actually did say. Now, here's what it would, you know, here's how hard it would be to actually do X thing. Here's what that would mean. Here's, you know, something about that. But I think it's really worth not letting his previous lunacy be baked in not letting the fact that he says crazy things stop you from reporting on the crazy things that he is saying. Um, but you, you, your first question of like, you know, resistance to Trump. I think that just by doing your job in the right way and reporting on the people who are affect, impacted by his policies for good or for ill, I think that's the job. That's, you know, just doing the work and being honest about what that looks like. Um, <clears throat> I think that there is an idea that people, you know, again, it's that idea that like the media is a, you know, I think we talked about this, but I really don't think that the media is as big a driver of political attitudes as some people believe it to be. Um, and so I think that for journalists who, oppose Trump. And I think it's, you know, not even just opposing Donald Trump 
the actual political entity, but opposing the idea of Donald Trump. Um, I think that the best way to work forward with Trump um, in this campaign or in the future is to just keep doing the work, keep thinking, you know, the promises he hasn't kept, the things that he wants to do that are impossible, like report honestly on that. And I, I just think that it's, there's something about Donald Trump that tends to, um, pe you know, online right wing people call it Trump derangement syndrome. And there used to be something people called Bush derangement syndr uh, syndrome before the Republicans decided that they, they, the Iraq war was bad. Do you remember that? Do you remember yeah. when Republicans thought the Iraq war was awesome? I remember that. I remember uh, when Democrats thought it was. Pretty yeah, everybody yeah, thought yeah. it was a really great cool. idea. Um, but I think that there is something that causes, you know, there's something about Trump specifically that causes people, and we're seeing this now on the very online right, um, that causes people to lose touch with actual issues and actual matters of importance because there's this idea that if Trump does it, it's different. That if tr that Trump changes the calculus on how life works, and we've seen this in how people report on Trump as being inevitable, even though technically he only won one election, mm -hmm. and so I think it's important to keep him in his place, keep him in the place of like a person running for president, like you know he's Ross Perot but taller. So, I mean, I do think it's always worth trying to ask, like what. Like, what do we do in journalism, <laughs> like at its best, right? And it's like, well, we try to write articles and hopefully the articles contain information that is accurate and interesting and like the audience doesn't already know these, these facts. And so we're, we're trying to like, we're trying to do the reporting. We're trying to write a headline that makes you want to read it. We're trying to structure the story in a way that like it makes sense, right? And so this tweet is like a really odd thing to say. <laughs> it is. But like, if it's like just pointing and being like, that's weird. <laughs> that's sort of not really journalism. Like that's not our value add to the world. Now lurking in here, there's this question about why do television broadcasting networks get exclusive FCC licenses without paying for them? See, these are the policy questions. That's actually questions a sort of interesting yeah. question, right? Yeah. Like, I don't know off the top of my head what the story of that is. I could probably ask someone, and because I'm a journalist, that person would probably answer my question if I like looked up a historian. <laughs> I could ask the chairman of the relevant committee in the House, like, what do you think about that, <laughs> right? Like I, I could write a story about this that would provide, I don't, be, the fact that like, I don't know what the story would say because that's real journalism, <laughs> right? Now, I, I think my guess is that like Donald Trump's policy ideas are not that sound. And that if I did a good <laughs> job of trying to report this out, it would expose that there's like some problem here with what he's expressing, but I don't know, maybe it's a great idea, right? <laughs> but, but the point is like, I would be doing journalism and like that is how you resist. I mean, like the reason authoritarian leaders don't like a free and functioning press is that inherently when you scrutinize the activities of government and the merits of policy proposals, like that is bad for an authoritarian project. So you just have to like, do it, right? Whereas like that USA Today headline, clearly the point of that is to make you think that Trump is bad, <laughs> but it doesn't actually convey any information, really. I'm not saying it's a bad story necessarily, but this is like this dynamic of like Trump and the press and it's like, we're at war and so like he's bad, but people who think he's good think he's good. And I think if you read the speech, what he says is, they say, I want to be a dictator. Yeah, I do want to be a dictator. I'm going to be a dictator for one day, and I'm going to clean up the mess at the border, right? And so then you're like, eh, she's actually being kind of unfair to him. But then it's like, to James' point, like, what does that mean? Yeah. Right? Like, immigration is a big issue for Trump. So like, what does Trump want to do on immigration? Well, he says his, like Biden says, is a complex problem with root causes. Trump says he's gonna be dictator for one day and that's gonna secure, like, that's not true. Like, that doesn't make sense. Again, if you like try to do the story, like what is the plan? And like, you know, I don't think you need to be like, and the plan is bad. <laughs> like if you explain it, 
people will read it. And as James was saying, it's like, I don't know, like maybe people will be bad people and they think bad things are good, but you can't stop that. What you can do is like try to be informative and interesting. Uh, on the well, and then so on the flip side of the kind of the other major candidate in this race, Joe Biden, on the other hand, also has a really extraordinary relationship with the media in some respects. Yes. Um, so for one, um, he almost never engages with the media. He's uh, he's done fewer press conferences than any uh, president in modern history. Um, he has literally never done an interview with a lot of the major media outlets like the Washington Post, the New York Times. Um, and, uh, and this kind of lack of engagement with journalists and lack of engagement with the press um, in itself uh, makes it, I wonder, like, I wonder to what extent does that complicate covering this administration effectively or fairly? And, um, uh, and uh, another thing that seems to complicate it as reported by the New York Times is that there does seem to be tension within the administration of when Biden isn't speaking of who speaks for him. Um, so between some of his White House spokespeople, there seems to be interesting tension. Um, so how do you think, uh, how does the Biden's kind of relationship with the media and approach to engaging with the media affect, do you think, how the kind of coverage of the election will play out? How do you, how do you guys think about um, how do you all think about, uh, yeah, getting around this, uh, about reporting fairly and kind of reporting on, the, on an administration that isn't hostile, like not, isn't talking about locking journalists up in cages or anything like that, but also is like really averse to really engaging with journalists. Yeah, I mean, I think he has a very particular problem right now. In general, like we always beat up presidents for not like the press wants the president to come talk to them all the time. And we complain when they don't. <laughs> and and um, and that's that's certainly happening now. But and, you know, but Joe Biden has a very particular issue because now there are these concerns about that, you know, um, about his agility and his able to, ability to think on his feet. Now, whether that really matters, again, I think is a real indictment of all of us, possibly, and how our expectations of the presidency have changed and the president, that there, this person is supposed to be communicating 24-7 with the American people, that we should be basically jacked into a train <laughs> via Twitter or whatever social media platform the president is obsessively using, Joe Biden isn't that kind of guy. He's an analog president, you know, in a digital era, and that's a real challenge for him. This is a little bit of a tangent, but I think it's an interesting. I was thinking, I was contemplating a counterfactual today. You mentioned Commander the dog. Mm -hmm. Can you imagine if Donald Trump had German shepherds in the White House? <laughs> I can write how the story many, immediately. Yeah. yeah. How many stories would you have read? And the, the term dog whistle would have been used over and over again about about the I can't the, imagine Donald Trump owning a dog. He doesn't. He no, hates he, he hates dogs. He's never, he's, again, he's, very suspicious. I, I looked it up, but he's the first president. He was the first president since Andrew Johnson not to have pets in the White House. And what do we know about um, Andrew Johnson? Right. <laughs> Although he was said to leave flour out for the mice, so even Johnson is anyway. Um, but we would have been hearing about the resonance, the 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 fact that, that these are you know the, the 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 links to fascism, to the Germans, to like let alone you know dogs who were actually attacking people and biting people constantly in the White House. If Donald Trump had had two German shepherds that were biting. Secret Service, I think it would have been a bigger story than it has been in the Biden era. I'm not, I think it probably is a good decision not to make that a huge story, but it speaks to the way we in the press do construct, I hate the term narrative, it's so overused now, but we do, and it makes it easy to write a certain story about Donald Trump that doesn't get written about Joe Biden, and I think vice versa. Um. I think the only thing that I will say is that it is interesting that we expect presidents to talk all the time. Um, we expect presidents to be constantly visible and just around. And I think that that is something that even, you know, the first president that I remember, remember uh, is Clinton. Um, because I missed a lot of the H.W. Bush era by being a very small child. But it is interesting how um, I've always said and I, I think that this is objective and fair. Journalists are messy bitches who love drama. And so if something happens that like 
you know, there are controversies where you look back and you're like, what even was that? And so I think that the challenge Biden faces is that you would think that if you had a Coolidge strategy of just never saying anything, that journalists would be like, ah, we will go do something else. But that's not how journalists work. They're like, the silence is the story. And that's not good. Yeah, I mean, it's unusual because um, I, I'm glad you put the, the story about the, the spokespeople up there because, you know, on the one hand, yes, like we have an expectation that the president will always be accessible. On the other hand, that's never true. And so on the third hand, like the practical <laughs> solution is that there's this, um, like this is a job, right? Like there's a press secretary, there's a deputy press secretary, there's somebody available. And in the social media age, like there's a Twitter account, like there are things that happen here. I, I think an interesting fact about the Biden era, right, is that in part because he's old, but in part as a, as a skill issue, like it, there's a lack of verisimilitude when Biden tweets, right? Like you don't, you're not even, I, I don't know who writes Chris Murphy's tweets, but I would believe that it's Chris Murphy. You know what I mean? Like it's it's close enough, right? Um, the Biden administration, the, the fact that they can't even settle unequivocally on who is the secretary in the briefing room is indicative of like a breakdown in the concept that like a president is surrounded by a team of professional communicators who all speak for the president, whether or not it's a human being at the podium who you can tell is the press secretary, it's an anonymous person doing the tweets. Presidents give speeches. We all know the presidents don't write those speeches alone, right? But like Barack Obama had a great working relationship with a great team of speechwriters who wrote speeches that sounded like, you imagine, if you've ever been in a room informally with Obama, Obama, you're like, that's the same guy who gives those speeches. Biden is not like that. Joe Biden delivering speeches sounds different from Joe Biden shooting the shit in the room. And that's like, that's bad speech writing work. And as Jim's just saying, like, it's criticism. Like, I don't want to get too obsessed with this because, like, that's not what <laughs> matters about the president. That being said, you do the communication stuff to try to make people like you. And like, I don't think they're doing a very good job of it. Like the seams show in like a, a weird way for such a professional, you know, if you ever cover like a mayor, you see a lot of this kind of stuff. Cause it's like, you know, it's just like not that big an operation and that's fine. And that's like part of the joy of local journalism. It's like a little more real. The presidency you expect to be like very fake and highly professional. <laughs> and it, it's, it's, you know, it's, it's like bad CGI. <laughs> when there's two different people up there at the podium and they're like, who's going to answer this? Oh, this is too political for Kirby. So so Corinne's going to do it. Like, that's odd. That's This is not how you, you're you supposed to run the briefing operation. I wonder, is this on? Can you yes. hear me? This would be a great time to take some questions from students. First of all, thank you. Can we give a round of applause for this time? Let's see if we can get some of our amazing budding journalists in our program up here to ask a few questions. Absolutely. All right. Hello. Idea. Can you hear me? Yep. Uh, so one of the biggest changes that has happened to the news is becoming digital, of course. And with it, uh, one of the biggest changes in editorials and corrections is the ability to do it in real time. Mm -hmm. So I would like to ask, how you handle now, both procedurally and technically, if you can share, uh, corrections to your articles, should they happen, um, especially in order to avoid abuse of this power to edit things in real time? Thank you. Um, I think that's a really good question. I think it's so important to be on the, being wrong in public, I think is one of the best things you can do as a journalist because Sometimes I think journalists want to appear, um, not quite like the voice of, from nowhere, but just like journalists want to appear as if they exist in the now. Nothing they wrote before or nothing they write in the future ever matters. Um, and I think that the best journalists do really good work when they either make corrections um, themselves and are really honest about it right away, or when they say they write something. I actually, you know, part of the class I'm teaching, we, do, we have a whole class upcoming on you know, revisiting things you did that were incorrect. For instance, um, the Washington Post columnist, Megan McArdle, she wrote a piece right after the Dobbs decision saying like, this probably won't be that big a deal. 
uh, in electoral politics. And then she came back at the end of this past year and was like, I was wrong. Turns out, who knew that this was going to change the game? But I think, you know, for me personally, I wrote a piece about um, uh, Section 230, the Communications Decency Act. Uh, it's one of the greatest laws in the history of time. You should look it up. You should get a T-shirt that says, I love Section 230. Um, ba basically, it's the law that uh, permits us to do what we do um, without getting sued all the time. But I wrote an article about it for Vox. And then I started getting all these emails. And sometimes you get emails from people and you're like, eh, I don't need to listen to you. But it's like emails from people who are like, I'm a professor at Johns Hopkins and you were wrong. And I was like, <laughs> oh. So then I you know, talked to my editor and I was like, I need to go back into this piece because I was wrong about everything. And I got it wrong in a way that many people do where they're like, ah, we should withdraw section 230 so that we can sue everybody or something like that. Um, and I think that it's really useful because sometimes you're wrong in the same way that everybody's wrong about something. You might be wrong in the way that people are incorrect about any number of issues from climate change to how energy policy works. And I think it's so important to be open to correction and to be open to being corrected publicly and to correct yourself and do so publicly as well. Hi, uh, my question is for James Bennett. I think you mentioned that people have a tendency to vote alongside their interests, but I don't know how true that is anymore um, in the sense that like, if you don't have anything material to offer people and all you really have is sort of just enriching kind of like rich donors and companies, you give people easy moral victories like on television because that's free because you can do that. So how do you like, how does the media show people that the emperor kind of has no clothes and that they actually might be voting against their interests in a sense? Like the, the closest comparison I can think of is kind of in Russia where you have like a kleptocratic petrostate oligarchy, but he takes, you know, Putin takes pictures with like patriarch Kirill of Moscow and wow, he's, at least he's not woke. It's like, that's great. Um, I'm, you know, there was this very influential book year, years ago called What's the Matter with Kansas? The, the thesis is, yeah. I've always kind of not been a fan of that argument. I, I just think, um, I think it, I, 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 I just, it, this, is, this, is, this is just saying, I, I, as I said earlier, I just have found People kind of, they want to make their own decisions about what they think is in their interest. And it's maybe not necessarily what, what I would think is in their interest, but they've, they've paid attention. And, and um, our job as journalists is to do what can't be done in Russia, which is to give them as, a, as complete a picture of reality, as, as we an accurate a picture of reality, and then let them make their choices. And... I just don't think, you know, that's that's with my news rep reporting hat on, with my columnist hat on, I'm making all the arguments about <laughs> how I think they should vote. With my opinion editor ha hat on, though, I'm I'm presenting them with this wide range of opinions because I want to, I want them to think for themselves. I don't want I don't want to pretend to myself that I have the ability to tell them how to think. Now that might be my knee, naive on my part. I, I recognize we are, I certainly am susceptible to be, being propagandized. I think as journalists, the way we help struggle against that is not participating in the propaganda. And as soon as we do that, we ought to be in a different line of work. Like I, I just, I, that's just not a way to do the work with integrity and, and not in a way that contributes to self-government in this country. Can I jump in just for a second? Um, I do think going to your point about um, the idea of people voting for self-interest. What self-interest means, I think, often we limit. We talk a lot about kitchen table issues, and I think what we mean by that is money. But what I think about are the issues that people see, that they're hearing about a lot. I'm, you know, When I talk to people in Salt Lake City or the areas around it, it's, it'll be interesting because they will hear about an issue that is massive, like a massive cultural issue. And the idea that you get is that from them is that if we, if the people in their car, you know, because maybe this is an Uber or maybe you're at Costco or something like that, that if you simply voted for these people, then the cultural issue would go away. Um, that if you voted for Donald Trump, there would be no more trans people, that they would just go away or ascend to, I don't know, a different place. 
or that if Joe Biden wins again, then the Trumpists will disappear and we'll never have to think about them ever again, that there will be this final victory in politics. And I think when people talk about voting in their own self-interest, I think that part of that is this idea that if you vote for this person, then you will never have to hear about the people you don't like ever again for the rest of your life. And so much of culture war, and the reason why culture war is endemic and it is perfect for our political age, is because culture wars are unwinnable, but they are also unlosable. There will always be someone out there who is doing something that you do not like, and you can hear about it. You know, if you read the American Conservative, which is a publication, old, you know, old issues, you'd hear Rod Dreher, who lives in rural Louisiana, writing about a teacher in Seattle as if the teacher in Seattle is personally going to come and make his children gay. Um, that is not what was going to happen. But like, it, you know, you could always find something somewhere that would make you mad. And I think that so often our politics, especially cultural politics, presents the idea that, you know, and you saw this in campaign ads in 2022, the idea that if you vote for Blake Masters, that that would ensure that, you know, every, every tongue would confess and every knee would bend that Trump was still president and all the things you hate would go away. And so I think that there is a deep self-interest for many people, culturally, emotionally, in voting in such a way that makes sure the people that they don't like go away. Well, but that's not possible. Well, the sociologist Max Weber had this idea oh, of- Weber. Uh, yeah. Uh, had this idea of that people, in addition to their material interests, also have what he called ideal interests. And so, like some examples of ideal interests would be um, being respected in society. Like the, or, you know, um, so for instance, Google just released this new image generating thing, mm -hmm. Gemini, um, and people on Twitter have been having a lot of fun with it because it, it's it often depicts. Um, if you haven't visualized things that should be historically uh, or today should be white men, it gives you a bunch of women and minorities instead. Um, so if you ask it to, for instance, depict popes, it will offer up a lot of um, non-whites and men when we have not really had until the most recent pope. Um, okay, um, so I think for a lot of, a lot of people who live in um, a lot of people who are themselves white men, Weber would argue, um, see their ideal interests threatened there. Like it's not really in anyone, like it's not gonna leave many people unemployed except for a couple people at Google maybe. <laughs> <laughs> but, but like um, the fact like if you feel like people like you are not respected in society or valued in society or are viewed as the problem in society and things like this. This is the kind of thing that people react against no matter where they are on the political spectrum and, and does inform um, uh, some of their voting, some of people's voting behaviors. And it's not an interest in a material sense, but it is what Weber would call an ideal interest. But I think even in a material sense, right? I mean, if people who live in the United States of America, for example, don't necessarily have a material interest in the war in Gaza. But if their inference is that your attitude toward the war in Gaza shows that you don't value Palestinian people or you don't value Jewish people, well, Jewish people do have a material interest in making sure that people who care about Jewish people hold office, right? Because we don't know what the future will hold, right? And so as the coalitions have gotten more elaborate in their kind of identity politics and who's held in esteem, this like stuff about student loan forgiveness seems to like really strike a nerve with people beyond I think the specific amounts of money at stake, but because there's a sense that Democrats are valuing young college graduates as you know people who, who really matter. And then, you know, if you're like a plumber who's 30, like Joe, it's not that like Joe Biden hasn't done anything for you because you probably have benefited in a bank shot way through his healthcare expansions, but he's never done anything to like demonstrate <laughs> that you, the hard hat guy who gets up, right, that Joe Biden cares. But Biden thinks he has shown that <laughs> by a lot of stuff he's done with labor union leaders, you know, and there's a lot of, um, it's a, but I do think there's a material interest at root because it's like, we just don't know what the next crisis will be. And we want to have somebody in power 
who cares about social groups that we participate in, because then our interests will be protected. Um, you know, and this is a big deal during COVID, right? Like nobody like elected people based on how they would handle pandemics. Yeah. But then they made choices based on what they think is important. If I had one wish right now, it's that the three of you could join us for an entire semester <laughs> to spend time with our students because there's so much more to be discussed. I know you all have questions. Panelists, are you willing to hang out a little bit and yeah, talk yeah, one-on-one? -on -one? So sure. could everybody join me in a round of applause? What a <laughs> fabulous conversation. I hate to cut it off. Thank you, everyone. Uh, feel free to come up. Yeah, yeah. Yes, yes, yes. Oh, can yes, you shut yes. off the uh, mics, though, so we're not like oh, on yes. mic?